1984, a man was charged with second-degree murder after killing a person while being filmed by live TV cameras seen by millions on the nightly news. Gary Plouchet, 39, had murdered Jeffrey Doucette, 25, right after the latter got off an American Airlines flight in Baton Rouge. Doucette was being held by the police, set to face trial. He was accused of kidnapping and molesting Plouchet's 12-year-old son. An assistant prosecutor quoted by the Washington Post at the time, Robert Hester, would claim, whether to indict Gary Plouchet will be one of the most difficult things a grand jury will ever be asked to decide. It was a clear-cut murder case, but a big chunk of the public was on Plouchet's side, who was seen as taking revenge for his son's suffering. If you allow one act of vigilantism, what happens after that with similar crimes? What if more people start taking justice into their own hands? What if someone innocent is caught up in the violent cycle of righteous revenge? The relationship between Plouchet, his family, and Doucette had started and prospered for a year before the kidnapping happened. Gary and June Plouchet had a complicated marriage and four children, three sons and a daughter. They had originally met Doucette when they enrolled their sons in a self-defense class taught by him. Gary Plouchet was a salesman and ex-cameraman. Eventually, he would use his contacts with a local TV station to get them to film Doucette and his students, including Gary's sons. Jeffrey Doucette was an ex-Marine who taught a Korean martial art called Hapkido. Hapkido is a hybrid martial art, employing both soft techniques, which are roughly about using minimal effort and redirecting your opponent's force, and hard techniques, which more directly engage the opponent with your own force and strength. Doucette had won over the plowshares with the tough regimes he would impose on his students, with daily 100 push-ups, 300 sit-ups, and 5-mile runs. All three of the Plouchet's boys had trained with Doucette, along with several other children. Doucette would regularly take them on countrywide trips to tournaments. The youngest of the Plouchet's, Jody, had even won a trophy at a major national karate meet in Fort Worth, earning praise of Doucette by June, who said at the time, You wouldn't believe what this has done for my children, especially the youngest, who is a slow learner. His balance was unbelievably off. He couldn't throw a punch without falling down, and his coordination was not very good. Now, he jumps rope like a boxer. He's got good balance, and he remembers things when he couldn't before. One of his students was quoted by a newspaper months before the kidnapping, saying, We learn discipline. We have better manners. We look up to Jeff a lot. He tells us to treat adults with respect, so we do. He tells us not to fight with our parents. He's my best friend. In the same interview, Jody said, He's all of our best friend, and we don't get into trouble at school. Eventually, Gary and June's marriage soured, and after Gary moved out, Doucette started to spend more and more time with the family, and especially with Jody, the youngest of the Plouchets. As time passed, Gary started to hear negative rumors about Doucette. Some parents started to claim Doucette had attempted to or molested their children. Later, it was revealed Doucette had a criminal record and a complicated history with fraud. Apart from the martial arts school, he had a business laying carpet with his brother, but had tried to use his students to sell football merchandise and other products to try to bankroll a nationwide karate trip. After the kidnapping, Doucette left a trail of fraudulent checks behind him. On February 19, 1984, Doucette had visited June in her house and had asked to take Jody to see a carpet he was laying. He said he would be back in 15 minutes. They weren't. A couple of hours later, June phoned her brother, who was a deputy sheriff, and Major Mike Barnett, a close family friend. June then drove to Port Arthur, Doucette's hometown. She reached the Doucette family home, which she had visited with Jeffrey several times, and Jeffrey's mother confirmed that he had been there but had already left by the time she arrived. She had no idea where they were headed. Around the time, Rumors started swirling around about June's possible romantic involvement with Jeffrey. There was evidence they had been really good friends, with June telling her divorce lawyer before the incident that he was a good friend who provided emotional support and that the kids like being with Jeff. He's kind and considerate. Some of June's friends said that they understood why she had lent on the young man through her divorce proceedings. June was a devoted mother who had abandoned a promising career as a nightclub singer to marry Plouchet and take care of her children. According to several sources, June had become intimate with Doucette after Plouchet left. Doucette would later claim, through his lawyers, that June had planned on joining him in California, 
where he was eventually found with Jody. Although June didn't comment on it, a friend of the family said it was unlikely. The hunt for Doucette started a couple of days later, after June realized that her close family friend and her son weren't coming back. She paged Gary to tell him about it, and he sought a kidnapping warrant. The FBI started their search, but the first big breakthrough came when Doucette called June. He told her that if she wanted to see her son again, she should bring her other children and their school transcripts to where Hill Street Blues was filmed. June, who had been coached by the police, told him Gary might use this to get custody of all the children if you don't bring Jody back. Doucette was unfazed. If the court gives Gary the kids, I'll get them from him. Then he went on a rage tantrum. I'm tired of people saying I'm insane, and if you say I am, you'll never hear from me again. June played along so the police could trace the call. It had been made from a motel in Anaheim, California, just a couple of blocks from Disneyland. Doucette was arrested on February 29th. He had shaved his head and dyed Jody's blonde hair black. He later admitted he intended to pass off Jody as his son. Although Doucette initially claimed that he was only guilty of bad judgment, when he was questioned by the police, he told another terrible, tragic story. Major Barnett, the family friend called originally by June to help, was involved in the investigation and subsequent interrogation of Doucette. During the police questioning, Doucette admitted to a horrible crime. He had molested and raped Jody, along with several other of his students in Baton Rouge. Barnett was horrified. Lab tests from the boys' physical exam confirmed the account. Barnett personally called his close friends, the Plowshays, to tell them the news. The Plowshays were beyond shock and anger, horrified and saddened. Doucette was flown from California to Dallas and then to Baton Rouge in American Airlines Flight 595. Police say Plowshe was seen at a bar sometime before Doucette's flight arrived. After he landed, Doucette was paraded through the airport, escorted by the police in a group including Major Barnett. Plowshe arrived at the airport and sat down to grab a cup of coffee. He checked flight times. He drank a Stroh's by the bar. He waited. When Plowshe saw Doucette arriving, he called a friend from a payphone and confessed what he was about to do. Here he comes. You're about to hear a shot. Doucette and the police escorting him walked through the airport's lobby near where Plowshe was standing. He was wearing a cap, trying to blend in. The call was still ongoing, with his friend trying to warn the police through another line. In a swift motion, Plowshe took out a handgun and put a 38 on the side of Doucette's head, point blank. His friend heard the shot through the phone right before Plowshe slammed the phone down, ending the call. As Doucette lost consciousness, Major Barnett, who immediately recognized Plowshe, shouted, Son of a b Why, Gary? Why did you do it? As he was forced to disarm his old friend. If somebody did it to your kid, you'd do it too, wept Plowshe as he was hustled off the premises. Doucette would fall in a coma and die a day later. Plowshe was charged with second-degree murder. Plowshe's lawyer, Foster Foxy Sanders, told the press that while sobbing in jail, Plowshe had told him that he had done what he did to stop Doucette from doing what he did to his son to other kids. The city of Baton Rouge would be shaken by the events, with every passerby sharing their opinions, and the rumor mill that had already been full throttle because of Jody's kidnapping going into overdrive. Sanders would mount a campaign to publicly paint Plowshe as a distraught father, who at the time didn't know right from wrong and thought he was doing the right thing for his son and for other possible victims. The case was really controversial, with theories ranging from Doucette actually being a victim of Plowshe's jealous rage to smears riddled with homophobia towards Doucette. At one point, Sanders said that Plowshe thought he was hearing Jesus Christ and that he felt mandated to take revenge. In the end, after pleading no contest to a charge of manslaughter, Plowshe received a seven-year suspended sentence with a five-year probation and 300 hours of community service. The defense was boosted by the subsequent reveal that Doucette had abused Jody for several months before the kidnapping. A psychological evaluation also helped them claim that Plowshe had been driven to a temporary psychotic state because of the pain suffered by his son, and the opinion of a psychiatrist stated that there was no danger of him committing another crime. He never did. Jody grew up to be a four-sport letterman in high school and eventually a tireless worker at a victim service center in Pennsylvania, 
teaching parents how to reduce the risk of their children falling victim to pedophiles. In 2004, he was named the Survivor Activist of the Year by the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. In 2014, Gary Plouchet died of a stroke. He always maintained he had done the right thing when he killed Jeffrey Doucette.